You know, in my opinion, the place that you will find the most active example of the body of Christ is right here at Misty Creek Community Church. Now, I know I'm a little bit biased, but I've seen this church in action be the body of Christ in motion. But if we would go to Scripture to see the example of the body of Christ, we would go to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And we see that there were no barriers whatsoever between the believers there. Rich and poor Christians, men and women, educated and uneducated believers lived and worked and ate side by side. It's really what we experienced when we were in Ecuador. There was an evening when we were gathering at the hostel that we stayed at, and there were folks from the community. There was the pastor and her husband and some of the members there and some of the missionaries and, and people of, of different social status all gathered together. And we were united as one as the body of Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And at that moment, it became a very thin place, as N.T. Wright refers to a thin place, when the kingdom of heaven meets the present evil reality, and they blend. And it's a beautiful thing when the kingdom of heaven is present and at hand. And I told those that were sitting around in that circle... I said, look around at each other. We've got different cultures, different ethnicities, different languages. This is a taste of heaven. And it was. And folks, where you are here this morning, in this place, gathered to worship God Almighty, as Jesus said, where there are two or more gathered in my name, there I am also. And Jesus said, He came to show us the kingdom and to show us, but also to bring us the kingdom. So we are, in essence, right now, tasting and seeing a piece of God's kingdom as we worship together in unity as the body of Christ. And so, in the book of Acts, we're told that even the rich folks sold what they had their possessions in order to provide for the needs of the poor members so that there would be equality among them. And what's the result of this type of unity and equality? According to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and the Lord added daily to their numbers those who were being saved. You see, their lifestyle was having an impact on the society around them. People were coming to Christ because of the example of these early Christian believers. But what's a real-time story about the body of Christ in this unity? I'll give you one. I have a hospice patient. She's actually a palliative care patient, which means she's not near end of life, but she has what we call in the medical field comorbid realities or comorbidities, which means she has a lot of health concerns. It's just a fancy medical word. She has a lot of health concerns, and she's not curable, but she's treatable. And... I went to see her at her home, and she lives in a, a, a nice home. It's an older home built back in the 70s, and her husband had built the home, and he was a landscape design uh, engineer, and uh, he had passed away about five or six years ago, and she was in this big home alone, and she had a lot of health concerns, and so now she needed some assistance. And she was telling me that she was thinking about selling the home after her husband had passed, and one night she felt the presence of her husband embrace her and tell her don't sell the house. And she was so thankful that her husband was with her. But she says as she sat there and she felt that presence, she realized it was not her husband. It was God. God was saying, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. Don't sell the house. Don't sell the house. Well, how can I afford this home? And how can I get around and do the things that I need to do? She had just had major back surgery. She said, I can't cook anymore. And this neighbor moved in right next door to her. Just so happens to be he's a professional chef. He has a son that's a technology wizard. And she has a smart TV that she cannot operate. So the very first day, the neighbors had just moved in. They came over and introduced themselves to her. And she told them about her TV. And the little boy came in and fixed her TV. It was a simple fix like they most are. You know what I'm talking about. 
And the man introduced himself as being a professional chef. And she says, oh, that's wonderful. She said, I'm not really able to cook. I love to cook, but I can't cook anymore. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. But he told her, you don't need to worry about cooking anymore. I'll prepare whatever you want, and I'll put it in small containers so you can freeze what you don't eat, and you'll have it to eat on you know, for weeks at a time. And she told him what she liked to eat, which is stuff that he's not used to cooking because he's a five-star restaurant cook. But he made her collard greens, <laughs> sweet potato souffle, yes, green beans seasoned with fat back. About 10 of you know what fat back is, and the rest of you are like, what's fat back? That sort of stuff. And he continued to do that. And then a neighbor across the street moved in, a younger man and his family. And he knew that she was an older woman. He had seen her a couple of times. And he came over and said, I'd like to help you out. Is there anything I could do? She says, well, my, my grass needs cutting, but I'll, I'll hire somebody. He says, I got that taken care of. I got a brand new zero-turn mower. You know what a zero-turn mower is. You know you're getting older when you talk about your lawnmower, <laughs> right? Zero-turn mower. But anyway, he said, I'll take care of that. And he says, any packages that you get, I'll bring the packages up to you because she has steps going all the way up. And she has a little apartment down below that she's leased out for years, but she didn't have a tenant, and she needed that extra income. And she prayed about getting a tenant. And a 19-year-old young man, a college student, has moved in to the downstairs apartment. He's wonderful. He gets her mail for her. He checks in on her. And so when I, I first met with her, she's telling me all this, and I told her I was getting ready to go on this mission trip, and the the theme was the body of Christ. And and she says, well, that's exactly what I'm experiencing. She says, look at all this that's happening to me. That's the body of Christ. Sometimes, many times, the body of Christ is moving in our midst, and we don't even acknowledge it. We're not aware of it, but yet it still acts, still moves. So the final characteristic of a healthy body of Christ, and this is the third in the sermon series, even though Doug preached last week on a different topic. But this is what I want you to know. The final characteristic of a healthy body of Christ is this. The believers share one another's joys and sorrows. We share one another's joy and sorrows. I'm thankful that Melissa and Carl Culpepper are with us this morning. You might be surprised that they've made the trip all the way from Macon after what Carl and Melissa have gone through this past week with his his father passing away. But they know this is a place where they can come. It's safe, it's secure, it's nurturing, it's loving, and they'll be ministered to by this worshiping community, the body of Christ. And so we will pray for them, and we will go through this with them. Just as we go through one another's sorrows and hurts and pains and diagnoses and whatever else, We walk alongside each other and go through this journey together. So we don't have to do this alone. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. As 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, for some people, that's a little hard to understand. We tend to value rugged individualism. You know what that is? I am a self-made man or woman. I don't ask for help. I can do it alone. I did it my way. Empathy, that quality of sharing our lives with one another, even the most heartfelt moments, is kind of uncomfortable for some of us. That's why we present such a nice facade to one another at church. And maybe you were a part of church, that's what you did. You dressed a certain way, you acted a certain way, you sat a certain way, you stood up when you were supposed to, you said the words, even though you really didn't know how you were saying them. We put up a facade. No matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what emotions are tearing us apart, we come to church with smiles on our faces and every hair in place. See, I'm living the victorious Christian life. I'm okay. You're okay, we say through clenched teeth. But we're not okay. None of us is okay. If there's one thing I've learned with the passing of each year is that none of us has got it all together. And for those that seem like they have it all together, they probably have the most inner turmoil as anybody. And they won't acknowledge it. 
and they just keep letting it fester and fester on the inside to one day they explode or do something drastic. Pastor David A. Rating puts it wonderfully in his prayer, a little religion is worse than none. A little religion is worse than none. How many folks go through the motions of religion, which is basically faith without Christ? Really? That may be a lot for you to digest this morning, but just going through the motions and not having an actual intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, who has suffered more than any of us will ever suffer. He is a great empathizer, and he goes through the struggles and the pain and the diagnosis that we receive that shatters our world. He goes through that with us. He knows what it's like to lose someone, to suffer, to grieve, to be mocked, to have pain, to be sad, to feel forsaken. He knows all of that. That's the Savior that we serve, that I hope you serve. And I hope you make Lord of your life if you've not already done that. The greatest decision you'll ever make is to follow Jesus Christ and serve him all the days of your life. So a little religion is worse than none. And then Pastor Redding writes this, deliver us from this Vicious cycle of going around crying out, I'm fine, how are you? So many of us have been stuck in this knot hole for years, though everyone knows the joy is not coming out of our ears. Are you caught in that vicious cycle? Folks, we weren't meant to bear our burdens alone. The body of Christ was meant to suffer with those who suffer and rejoice with those who rejoice. As a chaplain... I often hear some amazing stories that stay with me. Through Majestic Hospice, we had an elderly man suffering from cancer. Often he was in such pain that he would just lie on the bed and moan softly, Oh, 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 is me. Oh, oh, is me. One day, one of our staff happened to be um, there when the son's man, the son's The man's son was visiting. He was appalled to see the son lean down close to his father and repeat, Oh, me, oh, me, as if he were mocking the older gentleman. The son was quick to explain his actions. Before coming to the hospital, the man had lived with his son, daughter-in-law, and his two-year-old grandson, Wesley. Let me tell you about Wesley. That's a great name, isn't it? Wesley loved to help his grandfather. He would come alongside him, grab the bottom of his walking cane, and walk with his granddad around the house. Wesley would also demonstrate his friendship by echoing his grandfather's moans. Oh, me. Oh, me. In his own little way, Wesley was trying to share his grandfather's pain. That's what a healthy body of Christ does. We walk alongside one another and share one another's pain. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but I want everybody to take a moment and look around at the people on all sides of you. Look around. Just look at the people. Look. See who's on your row. Oh, I didn't even introduce myself to that person. I didn't even know who was on my row. Who is that over there? I've never seen them before in my life. You know, look around a little bit. You're online. I don't know what you might do, but look around whoever's with you. If you're driving, stay focused, Doug. Stay focused. Okay? Yes. Now, everybody that you're looking at, that you just looked at, believe it or not, Somebody on your row, somebody that you just looked at, may have a broken heart. May be struggling with something that you don't know about. You can't imagine. Despair. Stress. Grief. Uncertainty. Whatever it may be. People who are confused, angry, lost, scared broken in spirit, 
People on your row hoping that God would speak to them directly today, give them a sign, give them a message of some sorts. They need you, and you need them. That's what church is all about, folks. You don't have to go at it alone. In his song, If This Is Not A Place, singer and songwriter Ken Medema questions the true purpose of the church. I want you to listen to this. If we are not the body of Christ in the world, he asks, then what good are we? If this is not a place where tears are understood, he writes, then where shall I go to cry? And if this is not a place where my spirit can take wings, then where shall I go to fly? You see, before Christ ascended to heaven, he left us with an awesome responsibility to convince the world that God is alive and that God loves every person on this earth and is available right here, right now, to transform lives. Christ, Holy Spirit, fills our world and inspires so much of what we do. But it is in his body that an unbelieving world needs to see. It is in his body. You're the body of Christ. You're the hand, the feet, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth. The scriptures even refer to you as having the mind and attitude of Christ if you so desire that the Holy Spirit will give you access to the thoughts and will of God Almighty. Talking about having a huge responsibility, He trusts you enough to carry that. And that's what the body of Christ is. And Jesus doesn't just shove you off and say, go and do this. He says, I will be with you always. You don't go at this alone to the very end of the age. He left us with this great responsibility. You see, Christ, Holy Spirit, fills our world and inspires so much of what we do, but it is in his body that an unbelieving world needs to see. The world, the unbelieving world, needs to see us representing Christ, directly reflecting his glory as divine catalyst agents of transformation. They need to see him in us. They don't need to see us. They need to see him in us as the financial advisor. They need to see him in us as the banker. They need to see him in us as the real estate agent. They need to see him in us as the teacher or the counselor or the student or the factory worker or the salesman or woman or musician or dancer or stay-at-home parent. They need to see Jesus in us, even at the water cooler in the office. You see, that's where he meets us on Monday morning. In real time, where we are, he is there. As much as he is here with us now, as we've gathered, he can be with us just as much in the workplace, at school, in our home, wherever we go. We are the body of Christ, and we represent him at a very high level. So you better bet it matters what you say and what you do. And it is totally okay to take a stand and have a published thought at times, but it's also totally okay to not have a published thought and not respond and not be a coward on social media. Instead, be firm and take the higher road. Or just provide some scripture or prayer, or support, rather than tearing down, build up. There's something that we did while we were in Ecuador. It was called Speak Life. And what we would do is we could be, we could be working over at the school, sanding and painting these picnic tables that the students will eat on in their cafeteria in the fall. We could be uh, weeding out these flower beds. We could be doing a whole sort of thing, all sorts of things, you know, preparing the girls' dorm or whatever. And we would call out somebody's name in the group. We'd say that name loud, and the whole group would gather around that individual, and all we would do with our eyes open is speak life over them, speak into them. And it was one of the most holy and sacred moments. You'll get a little taste of that next week when we show the Ecuador video that Carl put together, which is a masterpiece, by the way. Speaking life over others, not death. 
That is the body of Christ. The believing world, unbelieving world, really, and the believing world needs to see Christ in us. They need to see us working together in unity, equality, and empathy. Not for our own selfish goals. You know, we don't go on mission trips and make lunches and serve on the missions team and work in the shelters and all where we say, look at me, look what I'm doing. We don't do that. Nobody wants to see that. You don't want me to get up there and do that. I mean, it's funny when you see the preachers that get up there and say, boy, I'm preaching today, you know, or they refer to their parking spaces as come visit our church like it's theirs. It's God's church. We are the body of Christ. He owns us. He has us. And he has equipped us to do his ministry and his work in this world. And it should be, needs to be, ought to be an honor for us to do that. To know that my sole purpose is to glorify him, tell others about him, and enjoy him forever. My sole purpose is not my paycheck. My sole purpose is not to get higher on the ladder, which those things are okay. But my primary focus is to keep my eyes fixed and focused on Jesus Christ, the author, perfecter, pioneer of my faith. For the joy set before him, he willingly endured the cross, scorning its shame. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Consider Jesus, who endured all sorts of suffering and pain at the hands of sinners, those who opposed him. And do not lose heart, and do not give up. Jesus was always looking to see where there was a need, the greatest need. He would be the one looking down his road to see, is there anybody going through something today? Is there anybody struggling with a migraine headache or a loss in their family or a diagnosis of cancer? Is there anybody that I can touch today and minister to and pray over? You know, <laughs> let me ask you this question. Well, I'm going to challenge you first. I'm going to challenge you to reflect on this question. What would Misty Creek Community Church be like if every member were just like you? Or ask it individually. What would Misty Creek Community Church be like if every member was like me? Think about that. Mm, some of you are like, oh, I don't know. Not sure. Not good. You know? Some of you are like, oh, yeah. I mean, I could go through and point out a majority of this congregation that you indeed are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that is, I've never served a church like that. I've served churches for many years, folks. Great big old ones and smaller ones. And per capita in this church, the servants that are here that have a heart for others to serve and just do whatever needs to be done and they don't do it for self-glorification, they do it to glorify God. I think of this worship team and what they do every week so that we can enter into the true presence of God. And the sweet aroma of Heaven's Bakery is smelled around here. We know that He is here, that His Spirit is amongst us. All glory to God forever and ever.